much, Ankush. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you're signing in from. I'm Jilika Trishal and I'm the Chief International Officer of Project Encephalon. And I welcome you all once again to Project Encephalon's Brain Awareness Week. So today we have amongst us Camilla Demestri, where, where she'll present an amazing segment on neurodevelopment. Camilla Demestri received her BS in psychology at Northeastern University and is currently a PhD candidate in neurobiology and behavior at Columbia University. Her research focuses on studying on how the brain changes in response to adversity early in life, leading to anxiety and fear related pathology in adulthood. She loves video calling her three sisters and mom to plan vacations near any body of water and gifting her plant clippings to anyone who's willing to take care of them. I'm quite a plant lover myself, so I'm anticipating one gift. I will happily send one over. <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. Okay, over to you, Camilla. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, especially because I started to get interested in neuroscience in my in late in my high school. And so um, I hope that this talk will um, excite you guys and give you a little bit of information to see if you're interested in neuroscience too. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about neurodevelopment and you'll learn very quickly that it is an organized chaos. So I have a question for the participants first. So if you can write in the chat what you, you think the answer is. Uh, my question is, when do you think that the brain is considered to be fully mature? Do you think at birth, at six years old, 15, 24, or 40? So I'm seeing one answer, 24, anyone else? 40, never. 24, 15, okay, so we're getting a little bit of a variety. So the correct answer is 24 years old. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of maturation in the brain and you can kind of divide the uh, development of the brain in two different uh, parts. There's prenatal development, which I will talk a little bit about today, but then I'm gonna focus the majority of my talk on postnatal development. Um, it's really interesting that the brain takes 24, maybe sometimes even more years to develop. And so there's a lot of really complicated things that are happening. And um, hopefully we can start to learn a little bit about what's going on today. So uh, the first, there's uh, three main stages of neuronal development. And this is uh, prior to birth is when they start. And then the last one will continue into adolescence. And I was watching a video the other day that I thought you guys would find really interesting. So I'm gonna play that for you guys really quickly. In yet another example of how amazing the body is, what I'm showing above are brain cells in a culture dish seeking each other out. They're trying to make connections with each other. You can almost feel a thought forming. This is just another reason why I think the body's amazing. My question to you is, what do you think? So this is a, uh, a doctor, he's a pediatrician and he works with uh, neonates um, and young, young babies. And so what you guys just saw right there are brain cells. Uh, you, you learned about brain cells or neurons in the talk earlier this morning. And these neurons are basically trying to make connections with each other. And these connections that they're making with each other are really, there's, it's a really important uh, part of neuronal development. And that is called migration. And also uh, it is not on here, but it's called synaptogenesis. And so uh, at the very, very beginning at gestational week four, so four weeks after gestation, uh, the very first stage of neuronal development is proliferation. And in proliferation, you basically are getting one cell growing and dividing multiple, multiple, multiple times. And at very peak, uh, at a very peak proliferation, you will get 15 million cells being uh, divided in only one hour. So this is a really complex and very important job. Um, the next stage is called migration and myelination. And so uh, once all of these cells have been able to divide, the next step is to become a little bit more mature in their myelination. And so you learned earlier today that uh, you have an, a, a neuron and this neuron has a cell body, the axon, and at the very end, they have the dendrites. And so on this axon, you have myelin that is protecting the axon. 
And in order to uh, efficiently send electrical inf information from the cell body out, you basically have to send these electrical pulses through the myelin to get to the very end. And so if you think about um, a cable that you have in your house to connect your computer, um, basically a cable also has rubber around the cable and the rubber around the cable is what helps electricity go through. And so that's exactly what the neuron is doing. It's myelin that is helping electrical signaling uh, go through the neuron. So um, uh, another big part of these stages is uh, myelination and the migration. So migration is the movement of neurons that are going from wherever they are born out to the brain. And the migration or movement of these neurons happens first at the very um, inside of your brain and it goes out. And so you'll learn later in my talk that the neurodevelopment will happen in this inside out where that very outside or the cortex is the very last part to develop. Uh, the next stage, which uh, you were seeing in this video, is called uh, synaptogenesis. So this is when the neurons are able to, now that they are grown and they are myelinated, they're able to connect with other neurons. And as you learned earlier today, the way that they connect to other neurons are through these synapses. So basically, one neuron is really, really close to another neuron, and they're able to send chemicals in between each other. And that's the main form that they communicate. And the final stage is synaptic pruning. So you, it's funny that you think when there's something developing, you think of neurons getting more and more mature and there's more and more neurons um, available, but a really big part and important part of development is actually the elimination of neurons. So it almost is like the brain is giving you more than you need to then figure out which neurons you are actually using and which ones you actually need, and it will get rid of whatever you don't use. So it's a way to, um, to protect the resources that you have. So now that we talked about um, pre-birth, now I'm going to move on to afterbirth. So a baby brain is not just a mini adult brain. It is not just a miniature version. It is a completely different brain. Um, a newborn actually has 120% of adult number of neurons. So a newborn has more neurons than you do and has more neurons than an adult. So that's weird, right? If you think of development, you think of more and more neurons happening as you grow, but it is actually those neurons going away. And most of that growth is happening from neurons increasing in complexity. So you can see in this picture that even though at birth, you might have more neurons, as you get older, these neurons get more complex. They form more synapses, they get bigger, they get more axons. And then after they get really, really complex, then you grow older and they get less complex. So you only keep what you need. Um, so uh, now I wanna go to talk to you a little bit about how uh, different brain regions develop. And so I'm gonna be showing you a couple of what we call developmental curves. And so these developmental curves, you'll see at the very bottom, they, it is a representation of, of the brain being less developed. And at the top, it will be a representation of more developed. And so first we have the motor cortex. The motor cortex is here in the red and it is involved in your movement, your grasping, every kind of um, movement that you do is, is uh, governed or controlled by the motor cortex. And it is one of the very first brain regions that develops. And if you imagine a baby, if you have interacted with a baby in your life, you'll notice that they're, they can't really do much. They kind of like sit there. But something that they can do is move their arms and grab something. They grab your hand, they grab your toy. And so um, you can kind of tell that this is one of the very first uh, brain regions that are developing. Very shortly after, we have the visual or the auditory cortex. So also, if you have hung out with a baby, you know that, the, that a baby cannot see very far away. And so it takes a little bit of time for that brain region to develop, to be able to see very close to you, and then being able to, to see farther away. Now, this is important because um, a baby, you would think it's not important for them to be able to see uh, a block away because they're not walking in the environment. 
the, the only purpose of their visual system as a baby is to be able to see only the mom that is in front of them or the dad or something that is right in front of you. So um, these, the, it's, it's important that this development is slow so that the baby can pay attention to what the baby needs to. Um, the next developing region is, is, well, there's two different regions here. We have the amygdala and the hippocampus. So uh, you've learned a little bit about these regions earlier today, but the amygdala is important in emotional responses and the hippocampus is important in learning and memory. And so uh, the amygdala, it is only um, at peak development later in adolescence. So in children, the amygdala is not yet developed. And so um, a way that you can kind of imagine this is if you have a little brother or a little cousin, you might have been maybe one day playing with them. And if you take away their toy, they start to yell and scream and they're really mad at you for, for taking the toy. And that can give you a, a little example that their amygdala is not developed. And so their emotional responses are very exaggerated and not very controlled. Um, but as you get older, your emotional responses are able to be a little bit more um, kind of perfect for the environment. You're, you're not going to start crying in class because you dropped your pencil, for example. And uh, the very last developing region is your prefrontal cortex. This cortex is important in decision making, complex planning, behavioral control. And so um, that's why people, you, you might have heard that adolescents are are bad at impulse control. They are impulsive, they make decisions really quickly, but then as an adult, you get older and you're able to stop and think, hmm, should I be yelling? Uh, should I go to work? Should I go to school? You can actually make these decisions in a very complex way. And so something to know is these are kind of the typical developmental curves, but the experience that you have in your life is able to move these curves. So as an example, if all of these curves shift or move to the right, it will be an example of a delayed uh, developmental curve. And on the other side, they can also shift to the left and you have an acceleration of the developmental curve. So the brain is um, developing in a very uh, particular order, but the timing of that development can be accelerated or delayed depending on the experiences that you have or, um, yeah, or the maybe I'll talk a little bit later about the trauma that you might have experienced or positive experiences. And so um, keep this idea later about the left acceleration and the right delay, because I'm going to be asking you a question later about this. So write it down. Left is acceleration and right is delayed. So in my lab, I use a mouse model to understand development. And I want to tell you a little bit of why we use mice. And um, one of the big reasons in why we use mice is because in humans, the contributors to neurodevelopment are a lot. There's biology can change your development, your environment can change your development, the experiences you have changes the, your uh, development. And so what we can do with a mouse is be able to just focus on the experiences because we can control the genes and we can control the environment. And so by being able to control two aspects that change development, I can now study how one of those things changes development, which is experience. And that's what the lab is mostly interested in studying. So uh, as you can imagine, many different experiences can change your development. And the type of experience that I'm interested in looking at is how early trauma or limited access to resources will change development. So for example, situations where you have limited food, limited uh, housing conditions, limited um, protection as, as a very young child. And so in the mouse, the way that we do this is we put the mom mouse and the pups or the baby mice into a cage that doesn't have the same nesting material as the control mouse. And so this nesting material makes it so that the pups don't have a safe home. And we study how an unsafe home will change development. And so, as I mentioned, the changes in development can happen in one of two ways. The brain can either be accelerated, which is shifting left, or it can be delayed, which is shifting right. 
or you can imagine maybe it's a mix of everything. And so what our lab is interested in is looking at, is it accelerated, delayed, or is it a mix? And so you might be asking, how can we look, how can we measure development in a mouse model? So the one thing that we can study for development in the brain is by looking at genes that are important for myelination. So I talked to you earlier about myelination being really important for a neuron to be able to uh, function properly. And so by looking at how the brain gets myelinated, you can use it as an index or as, a, as an example of, um, of maturity of that brain region. Another thing we could do is just look at their body, look at their physical changes. So for example, we can look at weight gain. Um, you can imagine maybe when you were growing up, you might have checked how, how tall you were getting at a very particular time. And so we can do a very similar thing with mice just by having them weighed. And another thing we can do is look at their eye opening. So mice are actually born with their eyes closed. And so by looking at how and when their eyes open, we can determine how much their visual uh, development has been, um, has been growing. And so here's a small video of a little mouse only six days old, and you can see that his eyes are closed. And another thing we could do is look at their behavior. So one really important behavior is called the right reflex behavior, and it is a motor behavior. So I'll show you here, this mouse is gonna be on its back and you'll see really quickly, the mouse will start turning over onto its feet. And um, babies will do this as well. So a baby, when it is really, really young, you put them on their back and they can just stay there and, and they kind of look at you. But as they grow older and as they develop, a baby will turn around, get on its hands and start crawling. And so we can measure these, um, these behaviors just to, just to know how, how well they are developing. And so I wanna show you an example of in the lab of us looking at myelination of different brain regions. So um, here we have the myelination of the motor cortex, which is important for moving the arms and body. And you can see that at, at eight days old, the motor cortex is not developed. There's very little myelination, but at 12 days old, the myelination is already really high. Um, but if you look at the amygdala, you can see that the myelination of the amygdala, which is important for, mo for emotional responses, has a very different curve. The amygdala has a linear development and it continues to grow, grow, grow until 21 days old in the mouse, which is basically adolescence, um, adolescence in children. And finally, I'll show you an example of the prefrontal cortex. So as mentioned, the, it is the later developing region and so it is not linear here. It is maintained very, very low until out of nowhere, boom, there's a really, really big increase in the development of the prefrontal cortex. And so in the lab then, I was interested in first, how does adversity change motor development? So uh, I showed you the right reflex behavior and uh, a control mouse will be able to turn around or write reflex um, on seven, after seven days of age, they'll be able to do it in one second or less. Uh, but a mouse that has experienced adversity, you'll notice it takes them a lot longer to turn around. And so you can see that this curve is shifted to the right because it is taking him longer to turn around um, which will tell us a little bit about their motor cortex. And then we can also look at cell division in the motor cortex. And we'll also see that adversity in mice who experience adversity also have a shifted curve to the right where there is, uh, it takes them longer to, to have the, the correct cell division in that brain region. And so my question for you, here's a little a quiz question is both of these curves are shifted to the right. Do you think this curve is a delay or an acceleration in the motor cortex? Let's look at the chat. Do you think that these curves are accelerated or delayed? Delayed, we got one answer. Delayed, delayed, yes, perfect. So the motor cortex is delayed in these mice. And so the next question was, 
does adversity delay all brain regions? Um, we had that question and we looked at the hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory. And we noticed, oh wow, it's a different curve. The curve is actually shifted over to the left uh, in terms of the gene expression of myelination. And when we looked at the prefrontal cortex, we saw that there's no change actually. And so what this taught us is that adversity does not change all brain regions in the same way. It is, um, it is more like a mixed model where some brain regions like the motor cortex are delayed, but the hippocampus is accelerated. And so um, it's really important to be able to understand how adversity is changing the brain so we can better understand uh, how the brain develops. And so uh, just to close up here, we, what we learned today is that brain regions develop at different times and at different rates. And we learned that our brain is constantly surveying our environment to be able to help us adapt to changing experiences. So experiencing adversity, your brain is changing the development of uh, different brain regions to help you, to help you adapt to that environment. And you might think that maybe it's a good thing to delay motor development in order to accelerate other regions that you might be able to use better. You might think that um, if you're experiencing really bad trauma early in life, maybe it's not that important to focus your development on your motor cortex, but it's more important to focus your development on your hippocampus so that you can better learn and better um, have, have better memories of that experience. And so it's good to know that as your brain changes, it's not that it's a bad thing or a good thing, it's just what it is. The brain is surveying and changing and it's very complex. And so we have to understand that it's doing the best that we can to be able to help us survive in, in that environment. Um, so with that, I would really like to thank uh, Project Encephalon. This is an amazing uh, program and I'm really, really happy to have been able to share a little bit about what I do with you guys. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions.